Welcome to Griffith Observatory. We still have a number of people coming in, so once they're seated, we'll begin our show. Uh, just, we'll just start in just a minute. We are streaming this show, so um, we want to get an on-time start. And in fact, you can all help us by welcoming our audience in just a minute. So, okay. Give it, we'll give it a countdown. 10, <laughs> 9, 8, 7, All right, welcome everyone to Griffith Observatory and to our golden moon celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission. How many of you remember where you were when Apollo 11 landed on the moon? And how many of you weren't born yet? <laughs> the vast majority. Yay, unborn children to be. <laughs> so we're so glad to have you all join us tonight. Uh, my name is Dr. Laura Danley. I'm the curator of Griffith Observatory and your host for this evening. And we have a wonderful panel uh, whom I will introduce in just a minute. Just a few uh, bits of housekeeping. If you need to leave, please go out the back the way you came in. That's an emergency exit. And in the event of an emergency, we will lead you out that direction. It can be very confusing, and you may never emerge again if you try it on your own. And this side is a closet. And just about every show we've had in here, we have someone sneak out, in the, and they have to come back and do the walk of shame past everyone. So uh, we encourage you, if you must leave, and of course, if you're in the middle, you can see you need to make people stand up. So. Uh, there is no intermission tonight, so we're going to try to keep things moving along, um, but we thank you for your help with that. So uh, you can keep your cell phones on, um, but there is no signal in this room. And so, um, and so uh, if you turn it off, you might be happier because otherwise your phone <laughs> will keep roaming and looking for signal and you will lose battery. And then you won't be able to call your Uber or whatever it is you plan to do with your phone later tonight. Um, so with those two housekeeping things out of the way, um, let me first of all say uh, thank you to um, our members of Friends of the Observatory. How many members of Friends of the Observatory are there in the audience? A few. Thank you, members. Friends of the Observatory is Griffith Observatory's partner organization that is, uh, provides support to all of our programs especially to our fifth grade school field trip program. We couldn't run that field trip program without the support of Friends of the Observatory. So if you are thinking about becoming a member, please do so. And if you think that the show was any good, and since it was free, if you throw a dollar or two or some even larger denomination bill into one of the collection bins for Friends of the Observatory, I know that the fifth graders of the city of Los Angeles will be grateful to you. Um, and then lastly, uh, how many of you are taxpaying citizens of the city of Los Angeles? Okay, that's good. I'm glad you pay your taxes. Yesterday's audience, there weren't many, and we were sure they were just being delinquent. Um, so uh, we, I ask that because Griffith Observatory is owned and operated by the city of Los Angeles, the Department of Recreation and Parks. Many of you may not know that, but this is a city park. It's just a very special city park with a very special facility. So for those of you who do pay your taxes, you, you support this effort, and we are grateful to you for that. And so, uh, so thank you, and again, welcome to all of you. And a special welcome to all of our people watching on Griffith Observatory TV. So audience, you want to say hello to our audience <laughs> on the other side of this camera lens. Hey. 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 <laughs> so uh, sit back in your jammies and enjoy the evening, and uh, we hope that you will find it as enthralling as I expect it will be. So with that, let me introduce our panel this evening. On the far end for me is Chris Butler. He is an astronomical artist uh, of great renown and talent and beautiful uh, artwork. He is actually uh, an employee of Griffith Observatory. He does his artwork for us here at Griffith Observatory. And he is also the son of an Apollo engineer and yes, uh, has, as a product, become quite the historian on the Apollo program. And so he's going to give us a little bit of an introduction to this topic this evening. Next to him is Rod Pyle, who is an author and journalist. He has written 15 books, and he said, if you don't count the NASA ones. Uh, so uh, he is also the editor of the Ad Astra magazine for the National Space Society and uh, also a wonderful historian, knowledgeable about all things Apollo. And then our superstar guests for this evening, 
Uh, next to Rod uh, is Don Harvey, an engineer from the former TRW, which had responsibility. Uh, TRW built, among other things, the lunar module descent engines, and you're going to be hearing all about that tonight, so I won't say more about what that is. But uh, he finished his career as the um, manager of engineering at the Capistrano test facility that uh, made all of these things possible. And then next to me is Jerry Elverum, who is the inventor of the design for the lunar uh, descent engine that we're going to be hearing about tonight, and the uh, program manager for, um, for the, well, he started out as the program manager at what was the Space Technology Laboratory, which became TRW, so he even predates TRW being TRW. Um, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineers. He's a fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics and uh, finished his career as the Vice President for the Applied Technology Division at, at TRW. And as he told me just before we started here, that's where all the fun stuff was. <laughs> all the super future looking lasers and cool technologies and he managed that group at TRW. So uh, with that, I would like to just pass it off to Chris. Tonight's, uh, oh, that is not true. Actually, I have a few more things to say. Tonight's panel is, as you see, from California to the moon. We take great pride in the fact that Southern California is home to the aerospace, some, uh, and the aerospace industries that made so many of the components of the Apollo uh, hardware that got us there, and you'll hear about that from Chris. I want to do a quick ad. We'll go for a commercial break right away. And just say that tomorrow night we have a wonderful panel, uh, The Once and Future Moon, which is a little more philosophical in nature. Why did we go? Was it worth it? Should we go back? If so, who should do it? Should it be an American enterprise, an international enterprise? Who owns the moon? These kinds of questions, uh, very thoughtful and interesting, thought-provoking panel. Again, if you can't come back up, you can watch it on live stream. And then Friday evening, we'll be watching, uh, screening the Apollo 11 movie that came out last year. Uh, this year, rather. How many of you have seen this movie? It is breathtaking. And if you have not seen it, and even if you think you know the story, there's nothing <laughs> like sitting in the room watching that movie because it puts you there. Uh, and I encourage you to see it. We also just uh, wanted to invite you to that because there's a special after hours rooftop party that is a benefit for friends of the observatory. So uh, we encourage you to think about coming back if you're up for that. And uh, so if you can't come, though, you can, of course, watch it on Griffith Observatory TV. So with that, now, Chris, can you please tell us a little <laughs> bit more about California taking us to the moon? Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, great to see you all here. And uh, hi to our audience out there who's sharing this experience. Uh, those of us who are here are in a very special place to observe the anniversary of the Apollo uh, program landing on the moon. Uh, although you, you may be wondering, maybe, maybe you should be somewhere else. Maybe you should be at Kennedy Space Center in Florida or, or in Washington, D.C. at NASA headquarters or at Houston, Mission Control, all the rest of this. Uh, uh, places, other places are having events all over the country to, to note this great event. Uh, some people really don't understand how thoroughly you are where you ought to be to observe this. Uh, now, I've mentioned, uh, yes, indeed, uh, my father did work on the command service module here in Southern California. This is Apollo Central. We have other folks here who worked lunar module uh, descent engine. You're going to hear about that, but it's even more than that. This program, while all parts of the United States did participate, Southern California in particular was really involved. And we're going to have a few uh, slides to explain just how involved. Now, there are clues around in place. The Los Angeles Times was kind enough to uh, hunt down and take some photographs of one of these clues. I've visited it myself. Up on telephone pole, there's a bolted metal sign saying Apollo Bolsa Team. That's a special connection for telephone lines. The boxes are still there. It's disconnected now. But this is a phone line that is always connected. The phone company doesn't do that for just anybody, by the way. Meaning you don't have to call someone. You just pick it up and someone's on the other end. In this case, NASA. Special arrangements were being made here because of the nerve center of companies working on Apollo right here where we are. 
There are buildings and structures all around, some of which you may have seen uh, giant buildings. For example, the one seen here. Uh, this is the room where the Apollo Command Service Module, the mothership for Apollo, was built. And that shows it in 1965, and then the same location when it had been converted to a uh, movie studio in uh, later years. Now, unfortunately, in this case, this is one of the buildings that no longer exists. But there are others that do still exist. If anybody here has ever driven down by the Seal Beach Naval Weapons Station down there, there's a stretch of road. It's the only stretch of road in Orange County where you can drive more than 40 miles an hour. Um, there's a big, tall, gray building standing, standing out there. And that's where the second stage of the moon, uh, the moon rocket came from. So there are clues for those who would like to know. Of course, now, this is what I remember. This is what my dad's work looked like when I would go there. This was one example of a company working on Apollo, and just this division of North American Aviation, there were 32,000 people working on it. 32,000. This is the size of a city. You may have heard that half a million Americans worked on Apollo. That's true. It's about 400,000. Well, there were 32,000 at this company alone, and there were other large divisions of companies like Douglas Aircraft, uh, that were, had large divisions, big companies working on this. So we're talking about many, many, many people in many different trades, all the way from mechanical trades, welders, electricians, and yes, of course, engineers and scientists as well. But many people from this area worked on the Apollo program. There are a zillion contractors involved and a zillion companies. No, don't try to read all the names. The point is jobs were spread everywhere. Even small companies, companies you've never heard of before. Uh, there's some company called uh, Leach Control Systems. It's in Buena Park, my old hometown. Uh, they, they made uh, con little control systems for the uh, spacecraft, for the moon rocket, all the rest of these things. And there were thousands of others as well. And as you can see, they're spread all the way across the country. I'm going to highlight what California has done, but I want to make it clear that there were suppliers all the way across the country feeding into the building of the spacecraft, what we call the prime contractors. The prime contractors were in charge of getting all the different components and assembling them in one place. For example, North American Aviation for the Command Service Module, that's in Downey, but they're getting parts from all over the country. Also, I do want to make the point, this is uh, from North American Aviation's newsletter at the time of the Apollo 11 landing. Uh, you can see there, there's a gentleman, Norm Casson, who is one of the senior managers there on the program, and he's demonstrating something that many people don't remember or notice. And that is that people of many different backgrounds and ethnicities were deeply involved, and women as well, deeply involved in all the aspects of the program. This was a time where this was changing in the country, and people were getting more and more involved, people from all kinds of different backgrounds. This is just one example of many, many, many. So regardless of whatever background you may come from, I want you to know that people in your family may very well have been involved in the Apollo program right here. In fact, may I ask, how many in the audience have relatives or had a, have a personal connection to people who worked on Apollo? Yeah, a good uh, number. No. That's and that's good. not unusual. Not unusual in it, Southern yeah. California. When, when I was little, I thought it would be unusual. I was sure that my dad was the only guy who worked on the Apollo <laughs> program. You know how that is with kids, right? And then I'd go to school and say, yeah, my dad worked on Apollo. Well, my dad worked on Apollo. My mom worked on Apollo. Everybody worked on Apollo. There were you know, all these thousands of people. There were probably well over 100,000 people in Southern California working on the Apollo program. So it's not a surprise. You can see here in some pictures activity going on in different places. Yeah, the valley, Canoga Park, Rocketdyne, building the rocket engines there. And then, of all places, Huntington Beach, Surf City. Those are third stages of the Saturn moon rocket being built. You may be a little surprised just how much of the Saturn V Apollo system
was put together out here. Let, let me explain it this way. Here's your moon rocket disassembled into its different pieces. We'll start from the top and work our way down. I'll color in in gold those pieces that California was prime contractor for. And you'll be glad to know the very tippy tippy top comes from the IE, meaning the escape rocket all the way at the top. That's Lockheed out in Redlands. So, well, that's it. We were involved. We got the escape rock. Actually, there's a little bit more than that. There is the Apollo spacecraft itself, the command and service module. It's command module, only part that comes back. That's a really critical part. Service module providing power and propulsion for it. And then also the, the kind of cone that goes back from that, that's called the SLA or the spacecraft launch adapter that encloses something which I am willing to admit did not come from SoCal, all right? There was a very important contract that's not from here called the Lunar Module. The Lunar Module is a New York girl, all right? She's from Grumman. Grumman Aircraft in Bethpage, Long Island, New York. So absolutely other parts of the country involved. Now, we've mentioned, though, that we have some Lunar Module-related folks here. I'll double back and explain. They are involved with this Lunar Module as well. Now, the next thing down to Saturn V is what's called the instrument unit. That's the brains of the moon rocket, the computer brains for it, made by a company some of you might remember called International Business Machines, meaning IBM. And IBM built that in Huntsville, Alabama. That's where it was assembled. The third stage, as I've already mentioned, Huntington Beach, Surf City, folks. That's where the third stage came from. You may be thinking it's unfair that any of the stages beyond that one would come from Southern California. Bad news. The second stage is also from Southern California, from the neighboring city of Seal Beach. Okay? Now, I will say that the first stage, the mighty first stage of the moon rocket, was built by Boeing Corporation down at uh, Michaud, Louisiana. Uh, so it's a, a southern facility was assembling that. But you'll notice I didn't color in any of the rocket engines in any of those stages. They're all from California. <laughs> Just mentioning. Um, that, yeah, Rocket Dine in Canoga Park. So they're all from the valley. And then while we're at it, we've mentioned the lunar module, but this diagram is drawn with the legs of the lunar module properly folded in. And that means you can't see any of the rocket engines for the lunar module, the ascent, the engine that got them off the moon, the descent engine that landed them on the moon. So it turns out both of those are from Southern California as well. And of course, we are going to have the opportunity not just to talk about history, but to talk to the people who made history, the people who actually designed and built those engines are with us. So you're going to hear from them in a moment. Um, as far as where in Southern California, this is just Google Maps. Well, I found a list of some of the suppliers for the Saturn V and just myself put a dot next to each city where there was a supplier. And if there was more than one, I put more than one dot. I know the list isn't complete, but here it is so far. There are even more than this. You can't drive through any of these towns, folks, without being in Apollo Central. That's where you are tonight. So, all right, yes, this is an accomplishment of all the United States, and absolutely, but I want you to understand that we were involved in some <laughs> small way. Um, yeah, not, that's taking it too far. The folks who built the heat shield in, you know, Massachusetts or what have you would be pretty angry if we didn't acknowledge the fact we all did this together. But I want you all to understand that with the Apollo program, the astronauts certainly understood that a lot of their uh, spacecraft had been built and so forth here. Uh, this is a picture of Neil Armstrong coming out to Downey to thank everybody. And the text is small, don't bother reading it. But Mike Collins, one of the Apollo 11 crew, He's quoted in the article as saying, the trip to the moon really started here. And really, it did. All the people who worked so hard on these programs took enormous risks with their own, uh, you know, their psyche, putting in all this time and energy. These are people that you know, your family members and so forth. We're going to be talking with people about some of these stories, always having the worry and the risk attended with manned spaceflight, as we used to call it, piloted or crewed spacecraft today. So this is not an easy way to make a living. It's not an easy thing to do. 
This is engineering on the edge for all the marbles, and it is something that we were involved in. Now, I wasn't there. I wasn't one of the engineers. Like this young lady here, I was one of the people who was watching on television as, in my case, my father conquered the universe. But the thing that's important for all of you to remember, when you're talking about Apollo, you're not talking about something that happened somewhere else. You're not talking about something that was done by other people. This is something that we did. This is something that happened here, and that's why we're celebrating it here tonight. Thank you very much. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to, uh, to bother you now, Rod, because my, my father may have worked on the command service module, but my brother-in-law lost all of his hair and all of his patience working on something called the Saturn second stage. I mentioned it's from Seal Beach. As an Apollo historian, can you explain to folks why my brother-in-law lost all of his patience and hair? You betcha. <laughs> so, this is the story of the Saturn second stage, the S2 stage. Um, if the first stage, which you saw in the earlier slides, which is the, the much larger one that had the five F1 engines with about a million point three point five pounds of thrust coming out of them if that's the hero of the beach this is the trusty sidekick that never gets asked out on a date the s2 stage was decidedly unsexy nobody paid much attention to it outside of the engineers working on it and of course nasa because they paid attention to everything but if you were just one of the hoi polloi like myself i was 11 when apollo 11 landed on the moon i didn't know much about the second stage except that it was the middle part of the rocket and i had no idea what a magnificent story i was missing out on so i'm going to geek out a little bit here for a few minutes i don't want to take too much time because i want you to hear from these magnificent gentlemen here but the second stage i think critically this was north american rockwell so they had already bid on years before and received the contracts for the command module and the service module which are the top of the spacecraft where the crew rides that was a pretty big project already, and it was giving them fits by the time this contract came up for bid. But being a large aerospace contractor with a hungry workforce, they bid on it anyway. Um, it was not an easy process. They probably, depending on which history you read, and, and very few of these primary sources agree years later, because at the time, these guys were moving very quickly to get to the moon in eight and a half years. They weren't worried about guys like me coming along 50 years later and saying, hey, these two sources don't match up. What's going on here? So it's a little murky, but by hook or by crook, they won the contract, and they got assigned building the second stage. So you're the last person in line when it comes to getting contracts, which means that you already have this massive stage below you that's generating about 7.5 million pounds of thrust forcing upwards, and then you've got over 100,000 pounds of mass above you in the third stage and the lunar module and the command module and the escape rockets and everything else. And you're the guy in the middle, which can very easily get crushed if it doesn't right, isn't done right. But it gets worse. So not only is that the case, but you've got these severe weight restrictions. The bottom stage is already spec'd out. All the hardware on the upper stage, except for the, the rest of the rocket, except for the lunar module, is completely spec'd out and finished. Everything's gaining weight as they're going along. Pieces of this rocket are getting heavier and heavier. And the demands that keep coming down to you building this second stage unit here are you got to make it stronger, you got to make it lighter. You got to make it stronger, you got to make it lighter. So these engineers are tearing their hair out, as you pointed out, oh, yeah. trying to figure out how to do this. So this stage was 33, 33 feet in diameter and uh, well over 100 feet tall with five J2 engines at the bottom. And the people designing it knew they were going to have to do something a little different. Normally, for a rocket stage like this back in those days, you'd have a big cylindrical fuselage with a couple of separate fuel tanks in it. You finish it, you test it, you gas it up, and you go. It doesn't sound very hard, does it? Well, the problem is that's real heavy, and it makes it longer besides making it just heavier. So the engineers involved said, OK, we've got to come up with something special here. Can you switch? So. Sorry for the schematic, but at some point you have to go to schematics. So down here, you've got the liquid oxygen tank, and up here you've got the liquid hydrogen tank. But you notice something kind of unique about these. There's just this curved dome here. So basically, this was built sort of like an egg or a big tennis ball, and the rest of this was another tank. So rather than making them separate tanks, they decided to take this entire fuselage, this cylindrical hull, 
and make that the fuel tank, which had been done once or twice before, but never at this level of lightness and thinness. And then this here is actually not a separate tank anymore. That's just a separating wall between the two. That doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you're talking about these exotic alloys, remember, this is the first time we had done all this. This was very early in the days of rocketry, especially at this scale, when you're talking about a moon rocket that's 363 feet tall, roughly the same size and mass as a World War II destroyer. Oh, and it's got to fly. So this is something that's extremely challenging to do. So you think, okay, you've got to build this separating wall. How hard can that be? Can well, I interrupt gosh, just it turns for a out second? it's very hard. Yes, please. You mentioned liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. So maybe some people don't know that that's actually the fuel. What happens when liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen come to, in contact with one another? Well, if you have a spark there, they get very angry and they explode. Okay. And so they explode in a very powerful way, by the way. So that is the fuel. You may not realize that, but that is the fuel. And as Rod just said, they explode in a very powerful way. So you do not want them right. to mix unless you plan for them to mix or catastrophe happens. That's an excellent point. That was the fuel they used in the space shuttle, by the way. So it's, it, it's extremely good fuel if you're not talking about the solid rocket boosters on the sides. So yeah, you want to keep them apart. And oh, there's another problem. They're about what, 130 degrees separate. Yeah, liquid hydrogen Different is about temperatures. minus 400 degrees. Liquid oxygen is about minus 280 degrees. So these fuels already don't like each other chemically. Now they've got a, chemi a temperature problem as well. So they thought, how can we make this separating wall to be very light and very strong in a structure that overall, if you scaled, it, if you scaled an egg, a regular chicken's egg, up to the size of this rocket, you'd have about the same structural dynamics. So think about how thin that really is. This thing could very easily collapse under its own weight if it wasn't designed exactly properly. So to make this, I know it sounds like a very basic thing, but to make this divider, they really had to think of some unique things to do. So one of them was they said, we're gonna make two different layers and we'll separate them with a bunch of plastic honeycomb. And they took that to NASA who said, excuse me, you're gonna do what now? Plastic, what's this? So there was a little bit of eye rolling when these ideas were first presented, but it really turned out to be the only way it could be done. And I work at JPL off and on, and as the engineers there will tell you, when you're looking at something crazy like the landing system for Curiosity, you look at the first drawing of that with the tethers and coming down the six wheels and being lowered by rope and all that, you think this looks nuts, and they'll say yes, but it's the simplest way we're sure it will work. That was the case here. So to make a long, interesting story short that I could talk about for hours, but I won't. Yep, two minutes. <laughs> they, they had to make this disc-shaped separator, which was a dome out of a bunch of pie slices called gores. And as it turns out, when you're dealing with alloys that are about one quarter inch on the outer rim and about one thirty-second of an edge up by the point, these are pointy pie slices, you're trying to form these things, it's really hard to do, right? But they found an interesting way, didn't they? They did. They couldn't even figure out how to make a machine that would make a machine to make the parts. So they made a mold for them, stuck it in the bottom of a huge water tank down near the Seal Beach plant where they were making this. It was over at El Toro Marine Base. Filled it with water, stuck a little piece of metal down there, a little thin piece of aluminum, and then set off a bunch of explosives over it to force it down onto that mold. Well, it didn't work the first time, so it turned out it takes three batches of explosives to do that. Yeah. Then you have to very carefully lift this flimsy little piece out, put it on another form, and then you've got to weld a bunch of them together to make this dome shape. Oh, but when you weld them, guess what happens? They start to buckle and tear and do all kinds of nasty things. So now you have to develop a whole new machine that makes a machine, stay with me here, that robotically crawls along this thing because you can't touch it with people because they can't climb on it and weld these things together. So this is just one small example of the kind of complication and thinking and high-end engineering that went into creating the moon rocket and all the components of Apollo. But this is just the beginning of the story because now, across the country, there's this company called Grumman who's building the first true spacecraft ever made, the lunar module, which is only designed to fly in space, can't fly in an atmosphere. It's designed to fly strictly to the moon surface and back. Its hull and the pressure hull is about the thickness of double the width of a bottom of a Coke can, so it's very light. 
very fragile, and something's got to let that thing land on the moon. And guess who did that? These two brilliant gentlemen here who were working at TRW and designed and, and tested many of the major components for the descent engine. So over to you. All right. Well, let me get to their slides here. Uh, so yes, um, we could not have landed on the moon without a special engine. This had never been done before. As Rod was just saying, nothing like this had ever been built or tested because you can't really test it here on Earth in terms of you know how to fly it. And so the unique challenges were presented, well, to NASA. We'll start there. But I understand you you took matters into your own hands and sort of said, I have a solution. Is yes. that correct? I, so, I had a solution. Great. So why don't you tell us about it? These are our guests. Uh, their names are there. So please do tell us how you got us to the moon. OK. Uh, what I'd like to do first is is take you back to the early days of the 1960s. In 1961, picture the fact that the president called a special meeting of Congress. And in that Oops. meeting, he threw out a challenge to the United States. He said, I think this country ought to take it as a challenge to land a man on the moon and return him safely to the Earth before the decade is out. Jerry, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. I believe your mic is muted. Not working right. So let me just put that off of mute. There. And uh, start over that again. Don, you might want to check yours as well. Yeah, no. OK, great. Yes, okay. can you just, <laughs> may I ask you to just start over, please? Is that working? Now it's working, okay. yes. Uh, I want to take you back to <laughs> 1961 and a picture it, that the uh, President of the United States calls a special group of, uh, of Congress together, and he makes a challenge for the United States. He says, I think we ought to take as a goal for the United States to land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth before the end of this decade. Well, when he made that statement, it was already a year and a half into the 1960s. So the clock start ticking down on eight and a half years. And the situation at that time was the president threw out a challenge. We didn't have a booster. We didn't have a second stage. We didn't have a rocket engine that could carry the first stage up. We did not have a spacecraft that was designed to land on the surface of the moon. We didn't have a rocket engine that anybody had ever designed that could throttle from 10,000 pounds down to 1,000 pounds. And we, all we basically had fundamentally was we had the technology to build the ascent engine which was a single thrust level engine, 3,500 pounds, and we had a lot of experience in building that kind of an engine. But that was the last thing to get them off of the moon and back into to orbit. Uh, it took another year after Kennedy threw out the challenge for NASA to even figure out how they were going to fly to the moon. What trajectory were they going to use? What was the whole operation that could get us there? Not only to define what all these parts were going to have to be, but to figure out you know, whether it was even going to be doable. After a year, they finally decided on something called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. And what it meant was we would send heavy spacecraft up to the moon, put it in orbit, and then when we put it in orbit, we will send a 40,000 pound spacecraft vehicle down to the surface of the moon. Of course, the 40,000, by the time you get down there, we've used up 50%, 60% of the whole weight of the system in propellant. So when we touch down, it didn't weigh 40,000. But at the time he commits us to do that, nobody had any concept of how we were going to do it at all. And so here was the challenge to the country. We're going to do it before the end of the year. 
We're going to have to develop the engines for the F1. We're going to have to develop the Saturn V vehicle. We're going to have to develop all the stages for the command module and the service module. And then we're going to have to develop a throttling rocket engine that would be capable of throttling and hovering around over the surface of the moon while the astronauts search for some place to set the thing down. Now, this was a major challenge to the country. It wasn't like we're just going to collect all these parts, bolt them together, and go. We didn't even know what the parts looked like. Yeah. And it took a year. So now, all of a sudden, we're counting down on seven and a half years to do the job. And that is a very short time. We've been trying to develop a new launch vehicle in America for the last 25 years, and we have not got it done yet. And we were supposed to get not only a launch vehicle, but a lunar landing module and develop all that technology now in seven and a half years. Well, Grumman, uh, NASA chose Grumman Aircraft Corporation back in Beth Page to be the lunar module uh, contractor, prime contractor. And because Grumman had a lot of experience with Rocketdyne, they chose Rocketdyne, who was the, the primary rocket engine company in that era, in the, in the 50s and 60s, to do that, mod, that lunar descent module, the throttling engine. They said, if anybody can develop that, it's going to have to be Rocketdyne. Uh, and so they selected Rocketdyne. That was, selection was made in the late 1962, before, while they were finally, Grumman was getting its act together as to what the spacecraft was going to look like. By January of 1963, NASA was getting very uh, leery about whether we were going to be successful in ever developing a rocket engine that you could throttle like a car engine, go up and down and, and on demand, give them whatever the thrust level they needed was. And so they decided, they told Grumman, you will go out for a backup uh, engine contract uh, to back up Rocketdyne in case they don't make the grade. And I went back to Grumman and uh, and uh, to NASA with a presentation said, I want to bid on that backup engine. And of course, Grumman and NASA looked at me, you know, like, why are you here and I in my office wasting my time? You're a spacecraft company, you're not an engine company. So let me say, how did it happen then that the, when Armstrong and Aldrin were standing in the lunar module, by the way, they weren't in seats. They had finally decided it would save weight if they could stand up and look out the windows, which, which they did. So they were standing on top of a rocket engine that was made by a few young engineers at a spacecraft, new spacecraft company called STL, Space Technology Laboratories over in Inglewood, California. Uh, and so how did that happen? If you go back, I have to go back and say, uh, when I was discharged from the Army Air Corps in 1946, I w went to the University of Minnesota and took a degree in physics. And at that time, nobody wanted to hire a physicist because <laughs> people thought physicists built atom bombs and nobody in Minneapolis was interested in building <laughs> anything like that. So I saw a little ad in the paper and a guy was going to drive to California and he'd take three passengers if we'd pay $25 to share expenses. Well, $25, you say, how can you share expenses for $25? But gasoline, when I went to California, was 19 cents a gallon. And that's 25 bucks, bought a lot of gasoline. So I came out to California. And when I got here, I still had to start looking around for a job. And I saw a little ad in the, in the paper in Los Angeles and said, we're looking for a chemist. And it, the little ad was for a chemist 
at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory up in Pasadena. So I called him up and said, I have a degree in physics. I want to come up and interview for the job. He said, we're sorry, we're, we're looking for a chemist. And I said, well, I have all kinds of chemistry background because I took a minor in chemistry and physical chemistry. I want to come up and talk to you. OK, come on up, they said. So I went up to Pasadena, and I started talking to the people up there in the jet propulsion lab. And I told them what all I had studied at the universities uh, in, in, to get my physics and chemistry minor degree. And while I was doing that, I said, I have as much physical chemistry and thermodynamics as, as if a guy had taken his degree in chemistry. And he finally kind of agreed. But then we got talking about cosmology and astronomy. And I was describing a telescope that I had built when I was 12 years old. And, and we, we spent the next two and a half hours talking about not the job, but by cosmology and how we should fly in space. And he got turned on by all that. He says, I want to hire you. You know, chemist, you're going to do chemistry work, but I want to spend more time on this other thing. So he gave me the job. That's really, I would call, a destiny event because I spent the next 10 years at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and what was I doing? Studying high-energy rocket propellants because the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was responsible to the Army for short-range missiles and the corporal missile and, uh, and uh, tactical missiles for the Army and JADO units, the units that went on, uh, used to lift aircraft off of short runways. That was all technology that uh, JPL was involved with. And so he gave me that job, and I spent 10 years studying all these hazardous propellants. And one of the programs that I was working on turned out to be exactly the same propellants that NASA four years later decided they wanted to use for the Apollo program. Well, I, the, the director of JPL took a job in, in Englewood from Raymond Woolridge Corporation to be the president of Space Technology Laboratories. And he went up there to be the president, and he reached back into JPL and says, I got to have some propulsion people here because we're responsible for Atlas and Titan and all the rest of the missiles. So he convinced me to join Space Technology Laboratories as head of their advanced propulsion. And one of the first things, they were a spacecraft company, but, but they said, First thing, we want to know how to develop a throttling rocket engine to maneuver spacecraft around in space, because they were military space people, too, and they could envision what was going to come along in the future, and they saw that you had to maneuver your spacecraft. So I used the technology that I've been studying and working in at JPO, and I designed a little 500-pound thrust deep throttling rocket engine and was and and it used two fundamental things it used a single injector pintle injector which was sticking out in the middle of the head end of the rocket engine instead of 500 and 600 holes drilled all over the face of the injector which everybody else was using at that time and they used it for the Atlas, the Titan, and the F-1 was using it. Everybody used that. And I designed it based on what I had understood the liquid phase reactions could, could be. And I just had that single pintle injector. Well, a single pintle injector turned out that if I want to throttle it, it's very easy to make a sleeve which which throttled the area of the fuel, throttled the area of the oxidizer, and gave me the optimum velocities in order to have good combustion. The other thing I brought with me was that when you're fooling around with things like fluorine and hydrogen and hydrazine and everything, you want to have absolute control of what the flow rate's going into your device is. Because if you can't control that, it, if you let it control the flow rate, you could go any place. Mm 
So I had used cavitating venturis to do all of my work at JPL on small engines. And I said, since it's a cavitating venturi, which Don will talk about, there's no reason we can't throttle that with a pintle into the throat of the cavitating venturi. Jerry, can I interrupt you for a second? Because you're using a couple words I'm not familiar with, and yeah. I'm going to guess there are other people who might not know what those words are. So just for a second, I'm going to dial sure, back and sure. say, uh, for everyone's interest, that a lot of these engines, you know, and, and Rod mentioned this, that they're just rated for a certain amount of thrust. You turn them on or you turn them off. And when they're on, there's that much thrust, and when they're off, there's no thrust. But what Jerry is getting at with the throttling, of course, is then you want to be able to vary the thrust. Crank it up, crank it down. And that way, like you were saying, the holes everywhere that just gave you a certain amount of fuel or no fuel, here you needed to vary the amount of fuel. Yes. And like we were talking about before, these fuels, if they come in contact with each other, that's an explosion right there. So you can't just have fuel kind of going or not going or you can't. It's got to be absolutely precise. Right. So there are th two or two terms you used I don't know. And one is a, and I've already forgotten. Uh, pintle? The, the, yes, the pintle. What is a pintle? A pintle is a pair of concentric tubes and the inner tube uh, has ho holes and slots around the end and a cap on it. So it sprays oxidizer out at horizontally. The fuel comes down as just a single sheet along the outside of that pintle tube. I see. And intersects with the oxidizer. So do you vary it by how much is in or out of the tube? And, and so now all we have to do is we have a sleeve, and the sleeve, the sleeve closes the outer off the fuel coming on the outside with a slanted sleeve, and down at the other end it has a sleeve which varies the oxidizer area. So by doing that, we can control how fast the fuel goes in. If you have a garden hose and you just reach over and turn the faucet off, you know what happens to the garden hose, it just goes down to nothing. Try running a rocket engine if you try to feed the fuel in at zero velocity. You get nothing out of it but a big explosion. So we have to vary the size and the velocity of the propellants going into the chamber, keep those up. At the same time, we had pressure-fed engine, so we had to figure out a way in which we could control the flow rate with a valve and keep the pressure across the engine uh, at where we wanted it for combustion. So if I can have the first chart here, let me show you that little 500-pound thrust engine that we were testing at SDL when Kennedy made his statement about going to the moon. And this engine here, the pintle you can see right there, there is the injector in the center of that engine. And here's a tip of it that's closed off and the oxidizer sprays out here and the fuel comes down here and immediately they react and distribute themselves into a great combustion. And so we have a sleeve around the outside here which controls both the oxidizer and the fuel. And back here, we have what is called a cavitating venturi, which Don will tell you about more, but it has a pintle that goes into the throat, and so it is closing the fuel and oxidizer down in flow rate, and that is now throttling this engine, and the two of them are tied together with a very simple mechanical sleeve. So for every position of this sleeve, there is a flow rate determined absolutely back here. It, this it, was a brand new innovation. You designed it? I designed it, yeah. but, and, it and it was because I came from <laughs> JPL at the right time. Thank you. Uh, but, uh, yeah. it, if but this sounds like rocket science, it I is. Took. <laughs> I took that back to Grumman and NASA, and I said, I want to bid on the backup engine for the Apollo program. And they looked at that little 500-pound engine. They said, but Apollo's going to be 10,000 pounds. And we were testing this little engine, if I could have the next slide. <laughs> 
at a small facility over in the middle, middle of Inglewood, California, by the airport. And we were running it at that time, and here's the little 500-pound thrust engine running in that facility. In those days, we didn't hide behind a blockhouse. We used to look ah. right out the window, <laughs> and, and I could sit in there and throttle the engine back and forth while I was looking at it's what was going on. It's a good thing it worked. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this facility then, that ran 20 to 1 with no problem at all, and the performance data was good, and the mixture ratio was controlled, and Grumman had to listen to me when I said I won an RFP to to bid on the backup engine. Yeah. In order to get the RFP, they said, okay, STL, your management's going to have to build a brand new facility somewhere in Southern California that you can access. And it has to be able to run the full MD duty cycle at vacuum, and it's got to handle 10,000 pounds, and it's got to do this and that. And my boss and I went to the management at STL, which was Simon Ramo. Some of you may have heard of Ramo Woolridge. That's a very famous company. And they agreed, we'll, if you win the backup engine, we'll build the facility. And, it, and, and if they built this whole facility and we lost the main engine contest, then they would have invested a whole bunch of money in a facility. But I said, you want to be in, in maneuverable spacecraft, you need a facility, you're going to have to keep developing engines anyway. So they agreed that they would do that. And Groma sent us an RFP. And, uh, and so now I was a, a one, uh, with that RFP, I started working on scaling this little 500 pound engine up. And I scaled it up to 5,000 pounds, if you could give me the next picture. And there is that engine <laughs> running. And here we're running in the middle of Inglewood, 5,000 pound thrust engine. And it was throttling and stable, and it looked just like the little one. It ran exactly the same way. It was stable and everything else. Then NASA came in and said, when you scale the chamber up to the exact, up to the 17 inches of the Apollo, design size engine, it's going to go unstable. And I had about 10 days to answer that question. And we, we put together what we called the lunar module 17 inch iron chamber here. And as soon as we put it on the test stand, everybody started calling it the iron pig because it looked like a big pig with a curly tail on the end of it. So that became the iron pig. And when we had to run the bomb tests in it to show that it would be stable, Grumman and NASA said, we're coming out and we're going to attend that very first firing. Oof. And now I'm sitting there with no, no time to check it out I got to fire it in front of the customer for the very first time um, and set off bombs in it to show that it was stable. So well, I have to interject. Uh, so you had 10 days to do this? Well, I had 10 days left when, when, I, when they raised the question of stability. So yeah. I only had like 10 days to build that. Do that. And chamber. did you sleep at all? Did you go home at all? <laughs> yeah, we, we did it, and it was stable as a rock. And, and, and uh, did you ever get home, or did you work 10 <laughs> days straight? No, I, I get home once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> and were you married at that point? Huh? Were you already married at that point? Oh, yes, and then my I, wife, I think Jean, is sitting <laughs> right. We need to give there. her a round of applause. <laughs> Put up with it. And of course, the kids put up with it because in those days, people worked the, and they weren't home to, to see their family as much. And when Apollo came along, and it was right after World War II psychology, you worked because the nation needed it done. And there was no way we were going to not get to the moon by the end of the decade. So we fired that, and it was stable, and they gave me the backup contract. And when I got that, I had to go tell my management, 
I'm sorry I won the backup contract. Now you've got to build a brand new facility for me down in San Juan Capistrano, <laughs> which they were happy to do, by the way, because they were very smart people, the top <laughs> management. <laughs> so, so shall I move on to the next slide here? So when we got the backup contract, if I could have the next slide, this is what the engine turned out to be when it was at full scale. And uh, there were a number of things that had to be done with that engine. Over here is at the 10,000 pound uh, size was the central element pintle injector with its sleeve and everything. And that drops into the middle of this engine. This engine is cut in half here. So the inside of the engine is on this side and the outside is over here. And here are the cavitating venturi valves which come up on this side and they feed into the shutoff valves. And Don Harvey will tell you about how, to, how we got that cavitating venturi valve to really work carefully and accurately. Uh, but the other job we had to do on this engine was it had to be uncooled and so we had to develop a brand new ablative liner to, to absorb the heat of the rocket engine. By ablative, we mean it was made out of plastic component and it would decay, absorb a tremendous amount of heat and fire off gases. It's the same kind of material that the command module uses when it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. It comes in so fast that the material on the front end of the command module is made of ablative material and that absorbs all that heat while they're coming in to, to, to land in the, in the Pacific Ocean. So that was the big things we had to do and then we had a uncooled skirt here that went out to 48 to 1 as the final skirt on the rocket engine. So uh, let me turn it over to Don who wants to tell you a little bit about the cavitating venturi valve and how tricky that was, but also tell you what that facility down at Capistrano had to do in order to run these kinds, this kind of an engine at vacuum in a, with the full exhaust of the engine firing into a vacuum chamber and how to evacuate that chamber. Yeah. All right, Don? Is this yours? Now that he won the contract, is my mic working? Yes, and actually I wanted to ask a quick question. You said it was the backup engine. So, so it was a backup in case Rocketdyne failed. That's did right. Did Rocketdyne fail? They did not fail. And, uh, OK, I'll come back to that then. Come so back you, you to that the... because it's an interesting story. OK, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> well, now that we won the backup contract, uh, Jerry needed some engineers, and I got hired. And I was assigned the job of design and developing of the <coughs> cavitating venturi valves. And what's pictured there is the oxidizer valve. And these are designed such that you have a linear stroke thrust relationship all the way from 1,000 pound to 10,000 pound thrust. And the, um, they operate in two modes, uh, cavitating and non-cavitating. And the non-cavitating mode, the valve's wide open and, and uh, the flow through the through the system is dependent on all the losses, the loss across the valve, the injector, the manifold, and the thrust chamber. But in the, non -ca in the cavitating mode, we're running in the 10 to 65% range. Uh, the valve is insensitive to anything going on downstream. So the pressures can change as they will downstream, but the flow rate will, will, be, con will be controlled only by the uh, pinnel in the flow control valve. And the pinnel is a, a tapered pinnel that uh, uh, goes through the, the throat of the venturi, and it's a variable area. And that's what at the point where cavitation is, is initiated. Now, both valves, the fuel and the oxidizer valve, are identical, pretty much identical. And they are uh, both water flow tested, calibrated, measurements made, and then they're, let me take the next slide. Then they're assembled with a throttle actuator and a mixture ratio control linkage to get the two valves synchronized so they're operating together. Then the next step is, uh, next slide, they get mounted with the head end assembly. 
in the, this is where the, now the valves uh, and the throttle actuator are tied to the injector. And there's a throttle arm that goes from the, uh, from the uh, throttle actuator to the injector that can be adjusted. And now we synchronize the valves with each other and the injector. And that's a very, very important uh, uh, operation that that is done correctly. And from there, now that we have the, uh, the assembly complete, we send it down to uh, the Capistrano test site. The next slide. Now this is a 2,700-acre uh, plot down in Southern California, Southern Orange County, where the southern border is the same as the northern border of uh, Camp Pendleton. There are four canyons involved, all lined up with, with beautiful uh, oak trees, sycamore trees, all kinds of uh, wildlife. It actually, it's the main movement corridor for the large mammals is through these canyons. So we see deer, coyotes, mountain lions, quite a few different animals. Uh, see the next slide. Now, the one of the main test sites that we that I spent a lot of time on was the vertical engine test stand. This is where we took that head end assembly I was showing, mounted with a uh, thrust chamber, did various tests on the on the injector to keep refining, test after test after test, making things better. The better we did on that, the more time the the astronauts had in, in flight. Uh, and I'll get into that later. Let's go to the next slide. When it comes to uh, altitude testing, we had this uh, high altitude test stand built. And you can see in the test stand there, there's a bell. And that bell is underneath there is where we install the, the um, complete LEM descent engine. And it's sealed and it's tied to a two-stage steam jet ejector system. And the, uh, there's an enormous amount of water required to, produ to produce the steam that we needed. And we had three uh, Thiokol 10,000 10, pound rockets blasting down into a steam chamber along with this high volume of water to create the steam to run this, uh, this system. And this is a system that uh, was used to, I think, to win the backup contract. This is where they ran the, the test that convinced the uh, NASA and Grumman that we could do the job. Uh, next slide. Now I, uh, well, about 50 years from this week, I was in New I was sent to uh, Houston to support the uh, powered descent of the uh, limb vehicle. And what we're looking at here is the, uh, is the, is the limb in orbit. And on the, uh, if you look at the 9 o'clock position on that diagram is where we initiated the, the first um, burn, which was a 30-second burn to put it in a trajectory that was a landing trajectory. And about an hour later, uh, about at 3 o'clock position on that diagram, the LEM was at 50,000 feet, and that triggered the power descent. And we started the 12-and-a-half-minute uh, descent to the lunar surface. And we burned, uh, I think, for about 386 seconds, we burned at full thrust and used, consumed about two-thirds of the propellant. And then we throttled down into the flare-out in the hover and landing uh, phase. And this is where we get down close to the moon where Neil Armstrong is now looking at the surface of the moon and trying to pick out a spot. And now he's got his hands on the control and moving Jerry's injector pinnel and the two valve, flow control valve pinnels very gently back and forth to get the, the thrust and position he wanted for his landing. And it wasn't long before we hear the eagle has landed. And yes. when they came in, they came in like about, I think it was around two feet per second descent rate, and about the same forward velocity, which is considered a, a pretty soft landing. The uh, amount of propellant left was about 750 pounds. Now, they started out with 18,000 pounds. So they had, uh, depending on what calculation you made, uh, you get probably another 20 to 40 seconds more flight time. But it was really the care we took in putting that injector, the head end assembly together and synchronizing the valves and all the work we did to perfect the injector that gave them those extra seconds to land. Yeah, some Next. of you may be aware that uh, the original landing spot was not a good spot. There was a crater and then there was a boulder field and, and so 
Uh, Neil Armstrong, well, actually, I think wasn't Buzz at the controls? Neil. No, Neil. Neil was? Oh. Yeah, yeah that was. Buzz uh, was reading off the numbers okay. on the computer. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so he had, to, he had to keep going longer than originally planned to get past all of those hazards. So it was the ability to have that kind of fine <laughs> control that, that allowed them to survive, because had it been done automatically, they would not have, it would not have been successful. Now, let's have the next one. Now, with the success of uh, Apollo 11, we had 12, 13, 14, all the way through 17, with five more successful landings and one very successful rescue. A rescue in space was really quite an accomplishment. And I think that's something that everybody involved with the Apollo program should be proud of. So we're talking about Apollo 13 there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we will uh, be having, at the time of Apollo 13, as for all of the Apollo missions, we'll have a program here to remember them, so come back. But anyway, so tell me who these individuals are. And this, this is a picture of the first deliverable engine that we sent back to Grumman. We got our win from the competitive program, the backup program, we won that program in January 1965, and Grumman needed to have nine engines by 1967 in order to be able to install it, in order to have any hope of landing before the end of the decade. So we're winning our real final Apollo engine program in 1965 in January, and we have to deliver nine engines in the summer of 1967. That's what the pressure was and how fast things were going in those days because everybody on the Apollo program was, by golly, going to make that date and not let us miss the end of the decade. So we got, this was the first deliverable final engine, and the, the guys around it are the delivery, space hardware delivery key managers. And uh, this guy right here is the Grumman representative to STL. Uh, and uh, when, when we were trying to win that final uh, contract decision, NASA had set up a big committee. And it, it, the question you were going to ask me before, they had the feeling that it would be an easy decision to make and that one of us were going to fall flat on our face. And that's kind of the way they were going in. Well, during 1964, it didn't turn out that way. The little company, STL, was building hardware and it was working and it was throttling and it was doing everything they wanted and it was stable. And Rocketdyne was a very competent company, but their concept of how to throttle the engine was very different. It was used the same kind of injection that they were familiar with. And what they did was try to change the density of the fuel going through these holes in order to keep their velocity high enough that they could impinge them and, and make them run. Well, that is a way to do it, and they, they were doing it, but NASA was still had its underlying concern, and the underlying concern could be, re could be really laid out in the ascent engine. After a year's development, they suddenly went unstable, destroyed the engine, and wrecked their test stand, and they took that engine away from them and gave it to Rocketdyne. But at the back of NASA's mind is, hey, this is the same distributed injector. It can go unstable, except it didn't. They were using acoustic resonators around it to keep it from going unstable, which could wreck the engine. But they still were throttling it. It was met its weight. It was there. They said we could use it. And Grumman said, well, I think we uh, I think we just want to stick with our original contractor. NASA put together a special committee and they went over all the data and said, hey, this we are worried about. We got bit by the ascent engine. 
We know your engine design is capable of going unstable, and therefore we are directing Grumman to use the new concept engine from STL, and they directed Grumman to close the Rocketdyne contract off and go to the moon with STL. I bet those were interesting meetings. <laughs> so these are the, the, the key guys uh, that were responsible for that. And the telephone call came while I was making my final briefing to the NASA committee, which was the head of Sam Phillips, from, uh, who was the headquarters uh, guy responsible to NASA for the whole uh, Apollo program. It was Max Faget down at JSC. It was two of our astronauts that were going to have to fly the engine. They were all up in, a li in my conference room up there at, at uh, Space Park. And uh, I was in briefing them. I was about two hours into my final briefing. The phone rings out in the front of the conference room. And the secretary who was monitoring so that they could call, they came in and, and she said, I got to talk to you. I got to talk to you. So I stopped my briefing, went out, and it was uh, Bob Altunian, the, the guy who was the receptionist from Grumman. And he said, we just completed a full vacuum duty cycle run on the limb, your limb engine, full duty cycle. Everything worked perfectly. We've got all the performance just where it belongs. And so with that piece of news, I could finish my final wow. briefing, you know, like, wow. <laughs> and it was Somebody like the same thing that us. happened on the Iron Pig. The yeah. customer <laughs> came out and watched me make the first run, which so it was like a destiny performance. And uh, if I could have the next slide, uh, that's me with my baby. Uh, <laughs> the baby was seven foot, six inches <laughs> high. And the next slide, uh, this is the Apollo 11. And we TRW put this out and distributed it all over the United States when Apollo 11 was successful. But that's the engine that set it down on the moon. And then if I could have another slide. Okay. You've heard. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you've, you've all heard about people who say America never landed on the moon. It's a bluff. It was all set up at Grumman on their simulator back there. Uh, and and it, you know, it's, it was a hoax. Well, here's proof that it isn't a hoax. Here is a picture from the latest lunar orbiter that shows the limb descent engine sitting on the moon. And if you look at it here, here is the descent engine sitting on the moon from Apollo 11 with the engine sitting in the middle there and the <laughs> tanks and the stage and some of the discarded covers and stuff like that. That's Apollo 11 on the moon, and we proved it was not a hoax. <laughs> <laughs> so can I have the last slide? <laughs> so NASA, in the Apollo program, contracted out uh, the history of the whole Apollo program. And that contract, was the whole history was finally named Chariots for Apollo. And in Chariots for Apollo, it states the following statement, which you can read for yourself up there. So, well, congratulations. And I'm pretty proud of that. And 400 <laughs> people that work for TRW are proud of that uh, history. And the allocate that that says that this was the technical development that let us do it. And everybody that worked on it just worked as hard as I did in order to make it a reality. Mm -hmm. So with that, I... <laughs> <laughs>
So I have so a question we'll if you're going to go to that. questions from the audience, if I may. Okay. Oh, oh go ahead, Rod. What's well, I just, because I, I just want to jump forward to the missions for a second. So Apollo 9, you're testing this for the first time with humans in it up in orbit, uh, Earth orbit. Uh, Apollo 9 engines. was in Earth orbit, but the big thing we did on Apollo 9 was show that the LEM descent engine could push the right. command module and the service module. So that was crucial to Apollo 13 because what we had to do was bring the astronauts and the command module and service module home to Earth right. by firing the limb. That was the key thing we did on Apollo 9. So that was actually where my question was headed, so thank you. So Apollo 13, as you probably all know because you've seen the movie, they had an explosion on the service module, which is connected to the command module, so the propulsion system's out, they're losing oxygen. they got to use the lunar module to help them get home and fire and them. Right. On the proper trajectory to get home. So now, completely different than what you had done before. You guys are in Houston, right? You're minding the yeah. store there. You're Don watching over this. Don was in Houston, and yeah. I was back at Grumman and Beth You're at Page. Grumman, okay. But you're in contact with Mission Control. Oh, yeah. You're watching all this. You're going to be firing this engine again and again for long periods of time. Was there a little concern about that? Of course. Yeah? Because this isn't, this isn't a cooled nozzle. As you said, this is a yeah. nozzle that can burn through if it fires too but, long. So I wonder if you could tell us about that. The concern, I will say that the landing of Apollo 11 was the most difficult mm. landing that we had to make in the whole program. And it was the first one. And we're sitting, I'm sitting back at Grumman in case it augurs in and doesn't work good, then I'm on the hook to go at the, at the simulator hangar and explain why we didn't have a successful engine firing. And so that's where I am with the world on my shoulders. Yeah. And we start having s alarms come in, which, which were really related to computer overload alarms. But we're, we're going to fire this engine for, for uh, 600, 800 uh, seconds, which is 12 minutes. And now we're starting to find a place to land. And if we land in the wrong place, it'll tip it over. And then they won't be able to fire the a ascent engine. So uh, Armstrong decided to fly it by himself. So he shuts off the computer operation and he takes the throttle and it's a gimbaled engine, a first gimbaled engine that size also. So he could switch the direction of the exhaust to, to go sideways and he could control the, the throttle on the engine so that he could go over the boulders and look around and try to find a better place and a better place and all the time they're counting propellant down towards zero. And I'm saying, Don, you better have had the calibration of those cavity <laughs> yeah. venturi valves perfect because we're using almost every drop. Well, uh, that was the most difficult landing of all. We found out later on Apollo 11, when we studied it, uh, that that there was really more useful propellant left in the tank. So we had two ways. One, we knew how much had gone through the Venturis, but we had to be, we also had sensors that said, what was the level of the propellant in the tanks? Well, because of all the juggling around, the propellant in the tanks was sloshing back and forth, and it didn't register the correct value of the remaining propellant because it would go high and low and all over the place like that. So we had, to, we had the abort there based on what they were reading, but we knew, found out basically later they had like another 30 seconds ah. that they could have used before they would have run out of propellant. Well, it's a good thing the error was in that direction and there was more e left over e rather than exactly. reading there You're was here. more than and there was. Uh, Armstrong there... was a gutsy pilot, you know, and yes, he, he was. was not going to abort that mission <laughs> five feet off the surface of the moon. So he kept hunting and then he finally set it down. So I'll take a couple questions from the audience. We have just, actually, we're already over time, but I'm sure there are people who would like to ask our guests 
Some questions, yes. Yes, I have a very quick question. When you were testing the LMDE at, at, at Capistrano, were you testing any other rocket engines at the same time, or was that the sole focus at the time? So was the question is, when you were testing the LMDE at Capistrano, were there other engines you were testing at that time, or was that the focus? Uh, at, at the time we were doing the Apollo, the focus when we started out was on the Apollo lunar descent engine. But we were also, once we built the facility, we were a spacecraft company that wanted to have engines for our spacecraft. So we set up four or five other test facilities at Capistrano, and we were running things like hydrogen, fluorine and, and uh, ammonia down there, and we were running hydrazine monopropellants, and we start running engines for all of the different TRW spacecraft down there in parallel with finishing the development of Apollo. Are there any other questions? <clears throat> yes. I remember hearing somewhere that you use rock prompt one, aka some sort of, I think it was kerosene fuel. So I heard somewhere that you use that for the they use that for the Saturn V. Is that so interesting? But the question is the young man heard that they were using kerosene for the Saturn V. Is that Rocket propellant one. That's for the first stage. Ah, there was oxygen kerosene for the first stage, the big F1 engine. Uh, and that's where the second stage and the third stage all used oxygen and, and uh, hydrogen. All right. I just want to say, any, any young person in the audience who asks a question about RP1, I just want to say I recognize a kindred spirit. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. We'll take one more question from the audience, and then I'm going to end with a question. Yes. Sure. Do you have any uh, patent rights to the design of the engine? Do you have any patent rights to the design of the engine? Yes. I, ha I hold the patents on the engine, but you got to think back. This was 50 years ago since we landed on the moon. I turned the patent. I have to hold the patents in my name but I turned those over, of course, to STL and later TRW, but they ran out 17 years after 1965 because you can only hold a patent for 17 years. So I've got the patents in my safe at home and I've got plaques on the wall which are the certificate for the, for the engines, but I have no patent rights commercially. <laughs> So the money isn't pouring in anymore from that. No, there. the money never came in. <laughs> <laughs> so my last question is, uh, you know, we always think of Apollo as a, as a testament to amazing engineering and amazing bravery. Something a little less glamorous, but that I often think about is it's amazing management, project management. Project management is not easy. I look at your, all those different companies all trying to work yeah. together, and, and I was really struck, Don, by your presentation of the amount of detail. I mean, for every valve flow issue that, for example, Don had to solve, there were problems and technical challenges throughout all of those components, everybody working simultaneously, yeah. everybody having to integrate together. So my question for both of you is, we now say we want to go back to the moon. As you mentioned earlier, we've been trying to build a, a, a new rocket for quite some time. What advice would you give to the managers today who are trying to get us back to the moon about how to be effective in pulling this together and meeting a target deadline date? You guys had no choice. You've said several times it's got to happen by the end of the decade. How would you advise the managers of today's program to just get it done? <laughs> <laughs> Punt. Well, I, I think what's missing really is, a, is focus. There's nobody, I don't think they have a, the leaders now have really a, a good focus on what we really need to be doing. And uh, I think uh, we need to have a compelling reason to go back to the moon, which means you, we've, Somebody's got to really think this one out. Yeah. But, but I would sure like to see us go back. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, my own personal opinion is that in Apollo, we learn several very fundamental 
things. One, you have to state a clear objective, a clear objective. We're going to send a man to the moon and return him to Earth before the end of the decade. That's a clear objective and a time constraint to do it. And that is what is required. We have been working in the space business ever since then without a clear objective. Oh, there's all kinds of programs with clear objectives. I mean, we're taking food up to the space station, we're doing this and that, and we're putting satellites all over. They have clear objectives. They don't all have time constraints like, like he threw on the Apollo program. But without a clear objective and a time constraint that says you got to do this, now that's the first thing you do. Once you get that, now you got to do a system engineering job which defines what is the criteria for every part in your system. And if you don't know that criteria and can't prove it, you don't keep going down the wrong path. You validate your criteria or you choose a different way of doing something. NASA in the Apollo days was a master at doing that, in my opinion. It was among the first real system engineering other than what we were doing at STL on, on uh, Atlas and Titan, which was the system engineering manager for those ballistic missiles. But NASA had Joe Shea back at headquarters. It had Max Fugé down at JSC. Those two guys were masterful system engineering people. And they divided the work up and established the criteria. And then they made the trade-offs. If this wasn't going to work, then you change and put the burden in some place where you have the criteria to take the load. In other words, if this is going to never really work, you move the problem to someplace else where you have criteria that says, well, I can always make the second stage a little bigger, you know, because that's not a technical showstopper. And they were the ones that were doing that kind of manipulation. And I learned a whole bunch of stuff from them. Right, so one, one key word of advice is learn from other masters. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. I think this is a rare treat, and I hope you enjoyed it, as we certainly did down here. And uh, we invite you to uh, enjoy the rest of our uh, 50th anniversary Golden Moon Festival. We have events every day until we've brought the astronauts home safely on the 24th. You can check it all out on our website. Uh, and if you want to relive this evening, it will be posted on our YouTube and live stream channels. And so will the rest of our programs through the rest of the uh, festival will also be uh, shown on the, those channels as well. So uh, let us thank our guests one more time and have a lovely night. Uh, I want to say one thing. The, the, the theme of, of, uh, of her whole Apollo week is from California to the moon. In this case, it's from Minnesota to California <laughs> to the moon. And it works are. out just as good as California. Thank you and good night, everyone. <laughs> How about Schenectady? I know. <laughs>